Aviation is a very regulated industry, but you already knew that. The question is, where can you find the regulations? How do you use them? And if you're already an expert, if you have your years of experience, should you actually revisit them once in a while to make sure you're current? Well, let's tackle this in this video and see if perhaps you can learn something about the new requirements in IASA. My name is Michael Svoboda from AirlineBusiness.com. Welcome. Welcome everybody, my name is Michael Svoboda from AirlineBasics.com, which is a blog I have created to share a little bit of my knowledge about aviation regulations, about the way an airline works, um, about the procedures and processes uh, which take place within an airline, especially from a maintenance uh, perspective. That blog has been around for a while now and people are commenting, people are sending me emails, people seem to be reading it, and I thought it would, it would be a good idea to start a YouTube channel with a similar subject matter. Um, this is the very first video I'm posting and whether or not there will be more depends largely on you. I have zero followers, I have zero likes, I have uh, I have nothing on YouTube as the very first uh, material I'm posting. So if you are interested, if you would like to see such a channel on YouTube, please subscribe, please give me a hands up and please comment down below, let me know what you'd like to see, what you'd like to learn about and perhaps I will be able to help you. Now. When it comes to today's uh, video, I would like to start with the very basics, and the very basics of every airline, of course, are regulations. And there is three main things I would like to touch upon in this video. And the first and foremost thing is where do we get regulations from? And in my video series, I will be focusing mainly on European regulations, which are the IASA regulations. They're somewhat similar to FAA. They're somewhat similar to probably most other regulations in the world. But the main focus on this channel will be EASA because that's what I'm familiar with. That's what I've been working with for the last 12 or 13 years. So that's what we'll be focusing on in this uh, in this channel. Now, once we know where to find the regulations, the question remains, how are they structured? How can we use them? And the third topic I would like to touch upon, and that I think may be some food for thought for a lot of people, is should you be revisiting those regulations? Should you be looking at them? Should you be reading through them? If you're already an expert, if you have your 10, 15, 20 years of experience, should you be actually going back to the resource I'm about to show you and browsing through them? So let's actually start at the very end. We will actually start with the very last question first. Why would you need to know the regulations? And should you be revisiting them if you're already an expert, if you already have many years of experience? Now the regulations, of course, describe what an airline needs to do in a certain subject matter. So when it comes to IASA Part M and IASA Part 145, those are the two sets of regulations which describe the awareness monitoring and also the maintenance processes going on in an airline. So regardless of whether you work for an airline, maybe you're a student who intends to work for an airline at some point, maybe you would like to work for an MRO and you're, or you already are working for an MRO, the regs will be the very basis of the work you will do. If you're an independent consultant, again, you will probably have certain requirements with respect to airlines, with respect to MROs, and again, those requirements must be based, at least at the very beginning, on the regulations which apply to the company you're currently at. So this is why we actually need to know about them, even though we're not regulators and we're probably not, I mean, unless you are, but most of us are not quality managers, most of us probably are not uh, accountable managers. But even so, the regulations will set a framework for the work you do and may allow you to uh, see a wider picture as to what it is, why you do what you do and why you do it the way you do it. Of course, if you are new to this, if you're only at the beginning of your learning curve, if you either just started a job or you may be still studying, it's quite clear that you should get at least a very basic understanding of the regulations which uh, rule this aviation world, if, if that's a word I could use. Question is, if you're already an expert, or at least experienced enough, if you've been working already for a few years, should you even care? I mean, you, you've seen it, uh, you know, you've been either working for airlines or for MROs, or you've been consulting for leasing companies, you've been you've visited places, you, you've seen processes, you know how things happen. And in my opinion, that's where problems can start. You see, regulations change over time. 
also when we gain experience we quite often shift our knowledge to customs we get used to the way things are being done we know something is done a certain way just because we have seen it over and over and over again now more likely than not it may happen that the customs are based on the regulations but are not the requirement per se so you may do things differently you may start thinking outside the box because the regulations only tell you what you need to do but they don't tell you how to do it so your experience from an airline from an mro even from two or three or five of them does not necessarily give you all the options when it comes to fulfilling the reg for it to that of course the regulator changes the regulations not very often perhaps maybe once a year maybe once every couple of years they add to it they subtract from it they respond to certain new developments uh, in the aviation business, the terrorism at some point. Uh, uh, currently, we have the COVID-19 outbreak. Perhaps that will cause some changes in regulations as well. We have aircraft such as ultralights. Whatever happens throughout the lifetime of the aviation business must be reflected in, in the regulation somehow, and it is, which inflicts changes to the regulation itself, which in turn means you should restudy it once in a while. Now I understand it's not the most exciting topic to read about, it's not exactly a, a book which you would take with you and, and, and be all excited about reading, I understand that. But it does give you a solid framework for what you need to do if you're working for an airline or an MRO, or what you can reasonably expect and request from an airline or MRO if you're either their customer or you're working for a leasing company, if you're a consultant, whatever it is you do, their work, even though they all have their own processes, must rely and must depend on the regs. So boring or not, you should be familiar with it. Now, before we dive into where to obtain the regulations from, let me just touch very briefly on the structure. Now, the way EASA structures the regulations is they will create, EASA will create a, the actual content of the regulation, and then it needs to be approved by the, by the European Parliament. And the European Parliament issues a decision. The decision has a number, um, some random, well, not random, but it has a number slash the year it was issued in. And only after the European Commission actually approves the regulation, it becomes law. And it becomes law in every European country. That's the way the European Union is structured. It also becomes law in not full EU member states if they have adopted the other rules. Within the regulation itself, we have the regulation, but then we have something called the AMC, which are the acceptable means of compliance, and we have something called the guidance materials, GM. The acceptable means of compliance are not the regulation per se. However, they do tell operators, MROs, how to implement the actual regulations. Now, it is possible because they're not the law per se. It is possible to implement the regulation in a different way. But you do, as the operator or as the MRO, you do need to prove to the authority that your method of complying with the regulation is equivalent or better than what EASA suggests in the AMC. Long story short, if you want to make something simple, if you want to understand it clearly, the AMC tells you how to do it. Now, the guidance material is something even more relaxed. The guidance material basically explains to you the regulation. It explains to you the, the, the gist of it. It explains to you how something can be done if the regulator believes that maybe the law itself is not very clear, or maybe it could be complicated, or maybe it could raise a lot of questions among different operators. So, three things. The regulation itself, AMC, acceptable means of compliance, and GM, the guidance materials. Okay. Now, let's take a look at where we can actually obtain the regulations. Okay, so we are here now in, in Google. Easiest way, of course, type in EASA, enter. The very first thing that, of course, shows up is, is the EASA main website, click. And there we have it, that's the EASA website. On the EASA website, um, we have a section that's called regulations. And within the regulations section, we have something that's called continuing awareness, which is right here. You can click it. And here's what you get. And that's basically what I have been talking about just a few minutes ago. We have, as you can see here, Commission Regulation number 1321 2014 of 26 November 2014. Now this is the basic regulation which is still applicable today. However, as you can see here, 
there's a whole bunch of other regulations which have added to it. They have made amendments, they have changed something. All of these are clickable, and if you do click them, actually let's do that. Um, open a new tab. Um, you can download it, or you can read it. You will be redirected to a page which is called EURLEX. EURLEX is a page which contains all the European regulations, not only aviation, all of them. And as you can see, they're all visible here in all the European languages. So whatever language you choose, whatever language, I mean, if English is not your first language, it's certainly not the first language for me, uh, then you can download the regs in your, in your own language, which on one hand makes sense, by the way, because of course, your language will be better understandable to you. But on the other hand, I have found um, that the translation is not always a million percent accurate. So if you are able to use the English version, I would strongly recommend to use the English version. Perhaps also French, I wouldn't know, I don't speak French, but English for sure. If you use the English version, if you communicate with people later on, everybody, well, almost everybody in the aviation world understands English well enough to be able to communicate with you. And if you're talking about one language version, it just may be easier. Um, so let's choose English, EN, right here, PDF, click, and we get the regulation. However, like I said, this one is only amending the main regulation which contains all the part M, part 145, part 66, and part 147. And if you look through it, actually you can see it right away, it's 22 pages long. So clearly, this is not the full content of part M, part 145, etc. because it's just way too short. Um, what is, however, is it is changing certain language in the main regulation. You can see here, let me maybe try and... Uh, oops, I should have made it smaller. Um, let me try and uh, expand this a bit. You see what it says, right? Annex is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. is corrected, like point M.1 point is corrected as false, point 4 is added, point MA201 is corrected as false. Now, the problem with this is that if you would like to follow all the new updates, you would really need to have all those new, uh, all those new commission regulations next to each other, and you have to see, okay, that's the original text, then they removed this and they added this, but then they removed that and added this. It would be really difficult and it's basically impossible. It really is. So, let's go back to the main page here. At the bottom, we have something which they call the consolidated version. Consolidated version of Regulation 1321 2014. And by consolidated, they actually mean that all those additions have been added into one file. So what you're reading is the latest and the greatest, is the most current part of the law. So, you can click this, and again we get the same EURLEX page. Choose English, right here, click. And there we have it, now it's 290 pages, and that makes much more sense for part M, part 1 for 5. Um, and that's basically, and it shows you here the amendments. So that's the basic regulation which is currently in force, 1321 2014, as of 26 November 2014. But it has been amended by five other regulations from 2015, 2017, and two from 2018. And these amendments are added to it, which is important because maybe there's a new one from 2019, or maybe there's a new one from 2020. Actually, the one we just looked at was from 2020. That's not included here. So, if you really want to be on top of the game, this one is consolidated up until 2018-11-42, but not further. And the one I just opened just a minute ago, that was 2020-something, so clearly it's newer than 2018, which means you'd still have to take that and take the new one from 2020 and see what changes have been implemented. Um, if we scroll down, We'll see here the actual regulation and give it different definitions. It gives you generic terms which are being used throughout uh, all the annexes. Um, what we casually call part M or part 145 or part 166 is actually an annex to this regulation. 
Um, so this regulation has four, well, it probably has more, but it has the four main annexes. And as, as you can see here, let me make this bigger. Uh, we have Annex 1, which is Part M. And of course, there is uh, the table of contents, uh, which I think is clickable. So if we want, say, MA301, click, yes. And down here we have it. You can go to MA301. And that's basically it. That's the regulation. That's the law. But, as I already said, we have also the acceptable means of compliance and we have guidance material. But the AMC and the GM is not here. You will not find it in this file. So we can go back again to the main side. And down here is something that's called the Easy Access Rules for Continuing Airworthiness, Regulation EU number 1321-2014. So 1321-2014 being the, the master regulation again. And if we click this, we get something in the form of a booklet. Uh, down here below we have downloads, we can click again. It's not EU or Lex anymore. This, this is issued by EASA, this is done not by the European Parliament, it's just done by EASA to make things simple for people like us. Now you see, now it has 826 pages. So the regulation had 290, right? Now we have 800 pages. But here, with the easy access rules, you actually have the implementing rule, which is, for example, part M itself, if you're looking at part M, you have the AMC for every single part M point or part M paragraph, and you have the guidance material. Now keep in mind, not every paragraph of the regulation actually has guidance material or actually has an AMC. Only selected ones do. Many do, but not all of them. So keep that in mind. If you cannot find it for a certain paragraph, it may just not exist. We can see here which amending regulations are included um, in this in this booklet and on those easy access rules. Um, and the latest one, as we can see, is from March 2019, so it's actually very current. And that's it. And then we start the table of contents. We have the cover regulation, um, just like we've seen before, uh, and we have the annexes like Part M. Now, the one we checked before, I think, was 301, or whatever it was. Let's go to MA301. Continuing awareness tasks, click. And that's what you will get. You have MA301, continuing awareness tasks. And that's the regulation. That's exactly what you would have found in the previous legal document, what I showed you just a minute ago. Word by word, that's it. But just below it, you will have in yellow the AMC, which are the acceptable means of compliance to MA301.1. So only for this point, five words, you have this whole AMC, which is look that long to explain it. It's a very good example because it seems easy enough. It seems the aircraft continuing awareness and the serviceability of both operational and emergency equipment shall be ensured by, point one, the accomplishment of a pre-flight inspection. Now most of you probably know what a pre-flight inspection is, right? It seems to be so obvious. And yet, to this very simple one point, we have this very long AMC, which actually explains what the pre-flight inspection is. Because right now we go further, and we have AMC MA301 for point two. It's about the minimum equipment list. And again, you have a lot of explanation about what the MEL is and how you know why it is required in this particular case. And that's why the AMC is so important. There's way more text in the AMCs than there is in the regulation itself, and that's why you should know it, and that's why you should be able to find it and revisit it. Um, now, let's go to another point. We have MA302, the Aircraft Maintenance Program. Um, again, in blue, that's the, the text of the actual regulation. That's the text that shows you, that tells you how to create a maintenance program. It tells you that you need to have the maintenance program, etc. Seems to be basic, but again, the aircraft maintenance program is a pretty complex thing. If we scroll down, MA302, we have the MAC to MA302, just like we did before for 301, and we also have guidance material to MA302A. Well, let's go scroll back and see what 302A is. 302A 
it's again a very straightforward point. It says, maintenance of each aircraft shall be organized in accordance with an aircraft maintenance program. Again, if, if you're already working for an entity of any experience, that seems to be pretty clear. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that that's the case. However, if we go to the guidance material, what we will learn is that the maintenance program may indicate that it applies to several aircraft registration as long as the maintenance program clearly identifies the effectivity of the tasks and procedures that are not applicable to all of the listed registrations. Why would that be important? Well, if you have a fleet of 10 aircraft and they're all so-called sister ships, they're basically identical, do you need to create and have and approve a separate maintenance program for every single aircraft? And that guidance material clearly shows you that you do not have to do that. Is guidance material a regulation? No. Because if you want to create 10 separate books, one for each aircraft, by all means you can do that. You will still satisfy the regulation. The only thing that the guidance material tells you is that you don't have to do that. It makes life easier for you, basically. So again, it's worth taking a look at it in case you're either setting up an airline, or working for one, or auditing one in one way or another. I hope that after this short video you will be able to easily find the regulations you require, you will be able to browse through them, you will understand what the regulation is compared to the AMC and the GMs and use it. When it comes to further explanations, I, I hope to make more videos about it at a later time. And like I said at the beginning, it does depend on you. This is my very first video. If you like it, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel, this way you will actually see what new videos are being posted. And most importantly, please leave me a comment down below, tell me what you'd like to see, what you liked about this video, what I could do better, because of course, being a beginner, clearly there will be a lot of things that I can improve upon. So, but I do need your feedback, so I know what is okay and what needs improving. Um, please take a look at the links below the video as well. I have posted links to the ASA website. Um, to those regulations uh, as well as to my Facebook page and to my LinkedIn profile. So if you'd like to follow me, um, I'll be more than happy uh, to get in touch with you. And that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching.